Greetings, sisters and brothers. Welcome to African History Club, episode number six. I'm your host, Milton Ali Mahdi. I'm wearing this beautiful shirt, as you can see, courtesy of my late sister, Barbara Ali Mahdi, who was a dedicated freedom fighter fighting against dictatorship in Uganda, my country of birth, and a committed Pan-Africanist as well. Barbara sent me a collection of beautiful shirts with an American friend of hers who traveled to Uganda and traveled back to the United States after the pandemic started, after the lockdown. By the time the shirt was mailed to me, Barbara had passed away on April the 27th. Barbara was just a great, great, beautiful human being and definitely was going to provide leadership eventually in Uganda. Michael Brooks, my dear friend who passed away on July 20th, wanted to have Barbara on his show as well. Now, as fate would have it, both Barbara and Michael are no longer with us. But we, all of us, must continue the good work. We continue the good work and we inspire others so that eventually one day, when we also are no longer here, our work, our dedication, our commitment to the struggle, to the good fight, will inspire others to continue. And that's the way it is. That's how good work is accomplished. When we inspire others to continue the good fight, whether we are here or not. So over the next six weeks, you're going to be seeing me wearing a brand new African pattern shirt. I always wear African shirts anyway, but you will be seeing me wearing new ones that I never wore before. I just received these shirts, the collection that Barbara sent, I just received them two weeks ago. And I was hesitant even opening the package initially because it brought back profoundly sad memories, of course. But then afterwards, when I opened it and I touched the fabric and it felt like I was connecting Sorry. So we've been surveying. Maybe it's not such a good idea to talk about the shirt. <clears throat> I was hoping it would have the opposite impact. It would allow me to start on a lighter note. But that's how life is. 
and you have to continue with the good work. So today, our journey, a survey of Africa's history takes us to what is called the Great Lakes region of Africa. So over the last several episodes, we've been seeing basically how African society was evolving before the European intervention. We've seen social formations of different forms. We were in West Africa. We saw the kingdoms of Ghana, Mali, Songhai. But we also saw that communal societies that were quite sophisticated were also evolving in Africa. So for example, the Igbo, who are in what is modern Nigeria, they did not have centralized, highly centralized societies. And the same thing with the Kikuyu, also very sophisticated societies in what is today modern Kenya. So the evolution was occurring in different forms. In other places, we saw the kingdoms, we saw the city-states on the east coast of Africa. Africans were creating social organizations, social formations, in order to best marshal the resources, um, enhance production, distribute the goods, including the surplus, and conducting trade creating networks of trading out networks within African regions and long distance trading, as we saw, such as the trans-Saharan trade, as we saw from the inner parts of the continent to the coast, whether it was on the west coast or whether in the east coast, as we saw with the case of Kilwa, which was in the coastal region, but extracting resources from the interior of Africa and serving as a gateway for the international trade. And we saw the same thing when we went to Monomatapa, which is the empire that came after Great Zimbabwe in Southern Africa. And now today we go to what is called the Great Lakes region of Africa. And when we talk about the Great Lakes region, in the modern era, we would think of the countries that are Uganda, Kenya, Tanzania, Mali, I'm sorry, Malawi, Rwanda, Burundi, Democratic Republic of Congo, and the Republic of Congo. That is the adjoining separate country whose capital is Brazzaville. It used to be referred to as Congo Brazzaville. And Democratic Republic of the Congo used to be called as Congo Kinshasa before it was changed to Zaire under the US backed dictator of 37 years, uh, Mobutu. And after Mobutu was overthrown, it reverted uh, to Congo. So now it's Democratic Republic of the Congo. So these are the countries that are generally considered as the Great Lakes region countries. And obviously, the major lakes are a Lake. Victoria, which of course was the name given by imperialist so-called explorers, but it had actually African names. And the, in the Luo language, Luo is spelled L-U-O. Luo, by the way, is the ancestry of Barack Obama's father as well. His late father was Luo, and Luo actually is also my own ancestry. So Lake Victoria was called Nam Lolwe, N-A-M, that's one word, and then L-O-L-W-E, that is the Lua word. And then in another language, the Luganda language, which is the language of the Baganda people who are in the Buganda region of Uganda. And we'll get more about Buganda later on because it's still a kingdom, and at one time it was a powerful kingdom. But anyway, in the, in the Luganda language, 
the name for Lake Victoria is, and I'll spell it for you, N-N-A-L-U-B-A-A-L-E, Nalubale. That is the Luganda name for Lake Victoria. So anyway, the major lakes uh, in the lake, in the Great Lakes region of Africa, Lake, actually let's call it Nam Lodwe, right? <laughs> Uh, Lake Malawi, Lake Tanganyika, and an assortment of other smaller lakes in Uganda and in the region. And these lakes combined, they amount to 25% of the surface fresh water containment in the world, 25%. So you can see why this is a very important region, has always been, and will be even increasingly so as the issue of water shortage becomes more pronounced uh, in the years ahead. But when we talk about the empires of the Great Lakes region in history, we are primarily focused on the most powerful of these empires, which was Bunyoro, Kitara, and Bunyoro is B-U-N-Y-O-R-O, -O, hyphen Kitara, K-I-T-A-R-A. -A. Now, it has a very interesting creation myth type history, which is very similar to the creation myth of Yoruba, uh, which is, of course, in modern Nigeria. The Yoruba believe the first, I can't even say person really, because he's not seen as a person. So let's just say the first to unite the Yoruba nation was Odudua, O-D-U-D-U-W-A, who is said to have descended from the hills or from heaven dressed in iron body armor and he united the Yoruba nation in ancient Ife, sometimes called Ife, ancient Ife, I-F-E. And then from there on sprung the entire descendants of the Yoruba nation, extending all the way to the kingdom of Benin as we saw in previous uh, podcasts. And in the case of the Bunyoro, the myth creation is centered around the Bachwezi, B-A-C-H-W-E-Z-I, the Bachwezi Empire. And the founders of the Bachwezi Empire were believed to have had possessed the powers to have the ability to disappear into the underground. So that's the myth creation legacy of Bunyoro Kitara. And the founder of the Kitara Empire was called Ndahura. And the rulers of Bunyoro, the kings, were called Omukama. O-M-U-K-A-M-A. -A. So Bunyoro, at its height of its power, controlled what is now, most of what is now modern Uganda, parts of Northwest Tanzania, Rwanda, Burundi, parts of Congo, parts of Malawi. It's quite a huge empire. And it gained its strength initially out of its iron smelting works. Because as we saw in Western Sudan, the empires of Western Sudan, the nations or kingdoms that were able to smelt iron were the ones who were able to dominate the others by virtue of having uh, more sophisticated weapons, being able to protect their soldiers with armor, being able to expand their agriculture and increase the surplus, which would always, of course, lead to the increase of the population and the capacity to uh, overwhelm and to conquer other regions. 
and that is why Bunyoro became the most prominent of the empires. Bunyoro also controlled the access to the uh, salt works in the lakes around the western part of Uganda, and it controlled the goods that were being transported by others crossing through the territory controlled by the Empire of Bunyoro Kitara. And by taxing those goods, uh, Bunyoro Empire was able to exact additional surplus in addition to also extracting tributes from weaker nations and empires in the region. So that was the reason why Bunyoro became the most powerful empire in the Great Lakes region of Africa. And its peak period of dominance was primarily from the 13th century up to the 18th, 19th century. The 18th century, it had started to weaken due to internal uh, dissent and other descendants of the Bachwezi had begun to spread out and leave and create other nations or other kingdoms, including the kingdom of Toro, the kingdom of Ankole, and then later on other kingdoms such as Rwanda and Burundi also emerged. The Bunyoro Empire and the subsequent kingdoms that emerged out of the Bachwezi dynasty were also known for their long horned cattle. So if you do some research, you'll be able to see images of these cows or bulls with this tremendous horns that extend uh, several, uh, several, several yards. And it's an amazing spectacle, really. So I encourage you to do the re research and look at the long horned cattle from East Africa. And so obviously these were the pastoral class. And in some cases, the pastoral class exerted, they became the ruling class over agriculturalist. And in some regions, it was very prominent in Ankole, in Rwanda, in Burundi, in Rwanda, in Burundi, the Tutsi became the ruling elite and they were the pastoralist class and they dominated the Hutus who were the agriculturalists. And some of that we've seen leading in our contemporary era to historical tragedies uh, conflict between these two classes in Rwanda and Burundi, the Hutu and the Tutsis. That is the subject of a future podcast. Another reason why Bunyoro Empire was weakened was the emergence or introduction of the region of firearms by Arab merchants from the east coast of Africa, when they brought guns and they were seeking and in fact implemented trade in enslaved Africans as well as ivory. So when the weapons became abundantly available in that region, now you have the African empires and nations that were traditionally competing over resources such as land, such as food surplus, such as just wanting military dominance. Now you're adding in a new factor, such as raids, raids for the purpose of enslavement of Africans. Now that the trade in enslaved Africans has been introduced in the region by the Arab merchants from the East Coast of Africa. So the region eventually became relatively unstable as a result of this conflict. And that was pretty much the setting by the time the European imperialist so-called explorers, such as Speak, such as Samuel Baker, started coming into the region, basically exploring and mapping out the region in preparation for 
conquest by European imperialism in the 19th century. And then later on, the contestation was between the Germans, who ended up controlling what was then called Tanganyika, and the Belgians controlled what is now Rwanda, Burundi, and Congo, and the British controlling much of East Africa, the countries that are Kenya, Uganda, and later on, after Germany was defeated in World War I, also ended up controlling Tanganyika, which is today Tanzania, after it formed a union between uh, Tanganyika and Zanzibar in 1966. So these were the formations that were organically evolving in another part of Africa. We've seen organic evolution in the Western Sudan, which is actually West Africa, the ancient kingdoms. We saw evolution in the east coast of Africa. We saw evolution in Southern Africa. We saw evolution in South Africa. And now we see the types of evolution that were occurring in the Great Lakes region. After Bunyoro uh, began to decline, in addition to emergence of Rwanda, Burundi, and the other uh, empires such as Ankole, such as Toro, Buganda also became very prominent, became a powerful kingdom, and the ruler of Buganda was called the Kabaka, K-A-B-A-K-A. -A -A. And Buganda became prominent primarily beginning from the 14th century onward. Now the interesting thing is these ancient empires such as Buganda, Bunyoro, still exists today in the modern state, which is now Uganda. So it's contained within the nation state of Uganda. But their roles have primarily been reduced to cultural instit institutions now. So even though the Buganda still has a Kabaka, and the current one is Ronald Mutebi II, his role and functions are primarily cultural now. He does not have the kind of political power, military power, that the Kabakas used to have before these kingdoms were initially abolished in 1966, four years after Uganda became independent. It was subsequently restored, but not to the extent of reacquiring the powers that they had in the past. So they're seen more like traditional cultural leaders today, but they still command tremendous uh, influence and allegiance of the population, of the empires, the ancient empires themselves. So, in, so for example, the Bunyoro are still very loyal to the current uh, Omukama, of Bunyoro and the Baganda people, which is how you refer to the people of Buganda, are very loyal to their Kabaka as well. So you have nation states or kingdoms within a nation state. And that at some point had also created friction within the country. And in Uganda, the crisis between Buganda kingdom and the prime minister at that time, Milton Obote, led to the introduction of an individual into the Uganda's political conversations. And some of you may have heard of this name, Idi Amin, General Idi Amin. He was the commander of the army at that time. And when there was a power struggle between Prime Minister Milton Obote and the Kabaka of Buganda, who also served as the president of Uganda, even though Obote had executive powers as prime minister, when there was a power struggle between the two in terms of defining territories, in terms of the, of the Kabaka wanting the administration to uh, leave the uh, territory of his kingdom during a major political dispute, Obote introduced Idi Amin into the equation to suppress 
uh, the Kabaka and his aspirations, leading to what is uh, called the so-called Buganda crisis. And the Kabaka had to flee into exile and ultimately eventually died in exile. And it also led to the erosion of Obote's political capital within Buganda, which is where the capital of the nation of Uganda is located and contributed toward Obote's own demise in 1971, when Idi Amin decided to seize power for his own self and overthrow Milton Obote. So I wanted to weave in a little bit of the contemporary evolution of politics in this region and tie it in with the historical evolution dating back to the era of Bunyoro, Bunyoro Kitara. Bunyoro Kitara, the Bachwezi dynasty also, was displaced when it was invaded in the 15th century by Luo-speaking people, L-U-O, as I indicated earlier, when they invaded and the amalgamation led to a new dynasty called the Babito dynasty of Bunyoro kingdom. So I think this brings us to the end of episode number six. In episode number seven, we will move on to North Northern Africa. So that will now give us an opportunity to have, this, to, to have covered in this brief survey of Africa history, all the regions of the continent. And then of course, as I indicated earlier, we'll do a podcast focusing on the uh, enslavement of Africans, and we touch a little bit on that today, very briefly though. And we will also then discuss the ancient African kingdoms before we move on to the era of European conquest and African resistance and European colonization. Uh, it is not well known in terms of the history of African resistance. Normally the narrative, it's as if Europe just walked in and conquered the African continent. Far from that, there were major stories of resistance, major African victories, which of course we'll discuss in the subsequent episode when we get to that, uh, that, uh, that podcast. And for today, I want to recommend, as usual, How Europe Underdeveloped Africa by Walter Rodney. There are many covers of this book, depending on which edition you have. I have uh, three different editions, because Walter Rodney, of course, is one of my heroes, and it's worth having uh, the various editions of his books. They have different introductions. I think the latest issue has an introduction by Angela Davis. That is the most recent edition of the book, I believe. I also recommend General History of Africa, UNESCO General History of Africa. And this is volume number six. And the editor, Ajayi, A-J-A-Y-I. And his first name is Ade, A-D-E. Once again, if this was your first time joining us, I welcome you, African History Club. We're getting an understanding of the Africa that prevailed that was evolving before the European intervention. And some may say the period of European colonization and rule in Africa was relatively short. That may be in the case, the, true, except for Portugal, of course. Portugal was al already there for, from the 15th century. So Portugal was there for a long time, uh, from the 16th century, rather. So Portugal ruled for over 500 years. In, uh, in Africa. But the other European powers did not come to colonize until the latter part of the 19th century. And then, of course, most African countries started decolonization in the 1960s. But this was a critical period. It was a critical period in terms of, this was the period when most countries were just industrializing. Many countries around the world industrialized relatively late, in the late 19th century, in the 20th century. But during that period when this dramatic transformation was occurring around the world, the technology was relatively available, Africa had been hijacked by the European empires. 
and these European empires were not going to allow Africa to independently industrialize and to be able to compete with the colonial powers that are actually ruling African countries. So that is why that period of colonization was very detrimental and very critical, and we see its contemporary manifestations today in the 21st century. Thank you, everybody. I will see you next week. I'm your host, Milton Alimadi.